And so I, I um, went back. I told my wife. We cried. We ordered more materials. We spent the whole $1,700 on materials for the, the, the medical clinic and uh, supplies and books for the people and for the children and, and for the church members. Uh, less than quarter leaves for everybody. You know, they couldn't afford any. And uh, so we were so happy. Man, God will send more. And sure enough, how does God send money deep, 200 miles deep in the jungles? I don't know how he does it. But we always started getting money for things. Uh, somebody called or we got an email uh, printed out. And the next time the airplane came in, they dropped off this mail. And they said, David, we've deposited money in your account. So I caught a trip out to town and got the money, brought it back in. And people would... We, we had no regular contact, mailing list, or anything. We were just praying, and money was beginning to come in. And, and we began to learn these lessons about God. The, the next lesson that we had to learn three, there was three major lessons, and then for a little period of interruption, then a fourth major lesson. And we've been operating with those four principles. The first one was, when God asks you to do something, he will provide for your needs. This is very important for you to understand. Because if you think that you have to provide for your needs, you may not obey God. When he gives you the opportunity. By the way, how do you know when God wants you to do something? Opportunity. You say, I didn't hear God whispering in my... God presents you with an opportunity. And when that happens, you know when you have an opportunity. It may be an opportunity to help somebody else go to the mission field. One of your young people here. You know there's young people here that would like to be missionaries. Maybe they would like to go build a church in Fiji. South America. Wherever it is, Papua New Guinea, but they don't have enough money to buy their ticket. And you have been blessed with enough money to help them, but you say, but if I do that, then I won't have this, this, and the other. That's an opportunity. You can let it go by if you want to, but you just missed a golden opportunity to learn more about God. It may be an opportunity for you to do good for somebody. Maybe you yourself should go. You see what I mean? There's multiple opportunities. Maybe it's an opportunity to help the pastor of your church to do evangelistic meetings or to give Bible studies. Maybe it's an opportunity to do something else. There, there's thousands around you, but the moment you come face to face with an opportunity, that is God's calling to you at that moment. And no doubt it will take you out of your comfort zone. Because God is not in the habit of coddling you right now. If he did that, he would kill you. Because people who get coddled never make it through the final crisis. God is not doing that. He loves you too much. So he's asking you to do things that you cannot afford to do. Asking you to do things that are painful for you, like giving up things that were close to you. And, and if you do it for others, for the sake of advancing God's work, you will find out the beautiful secret that God will turn it right around and give it right back to you so that you can do it again. There, there's a false theology going around that's called, uh, that's called prosperity theology. If you give to this ministry... You can get wealthy. You can buy the best cars, have the boats and jets. If you just give to God, he will give you the riches of this world. And people go, ah, yes, that's what I want. And out of greed, they give. That's called prosperity theology. It's totally false. It's sweeping the world right now. You know what, you know what God's theology is today? Sacrifice theology. I want you to give up everything you have. It's going, you're going to lose it anyhow. While well, you still have an opportunity, let me tell you how to manage your resources so that nobody will take them from you. You will invest them all, little by little, in God's work. And when it's time to walk away from it, when it's all going to, there's nothing left. Then you'll be glad. The best thing that can happen to you is to have to walk away from everything and say, I have nothing to walk away from. I gave it all away. It's in God's work. Isn't that a wonderful thing? But you say, but David, is that happening now? Absolutely. It's happening right now. God is asking Seventh day Adventists today to walk that little narrow path that Sister White saw when she was only 17 years old, when she, was, when she saw in early writings that little narrow path. And God's people had to let go of the carriages, let go of the horses, let go of the suitcases. Anybody who refused to let go fell off the path. And finally, even their shoes. But as the path got more narrow... There was a cord let down from heaven and they were able to hang on to that cord and the, the further they went, the bigger the cord got. That's their experience with God. And pretty soon they came to the place where there was no path left and they had to put their entire weight on that cord and they swung across to the other side. If you don't have an experience with God that keeps growing and growing in your hands, when that time comes, you're not going to stay with the people of God. 
Your life depends on it. You either start developing an experience with God of dependence on Him and following what He tells you to do, or you're not going to make it. You say, well, David, isn't that being a little hard? Well, it's truth. What else do you want me to tell you? Do you want to come to me if I'm a doctor and I find out you have cancer and I tell you, you're doing just fine, thank you. And I whisper to my colleague, six weeks to live. But I don't want to tell her hard news. I don't want to tell him hard news. This is not kind. It's the other way around. Truth is the best thing you can tell somebody. Amen. And Seventh-day Adventists better learn very soon how to learn to trust God or you're not going to survive the final crisis. You're just a club member and no club members will make it through the final crisis. If you're part of the Adventist movement, then get ready, soldier. Start learning some tough rules. God will carry you through, but you have to learn to trust Him. And when all human support is gone, you better have something in your hands to hang on. The third lesson. The first lesson was God will provide for your needs. The second lesson was give and it shall be given unto you. Not so you can keep it, so you can give again. Third, two captains walked in. They wanted me to go with them to their village, two village captain chiefs. And I said, sure, I'll go with you. Where do you live? And they said, only four days walking in this direction. It's not very far. <laughs> four days there, four days back, just so I could spend one day in their village. I didn't like the idea. So I started praying for an airplane. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and the Lord never sent the money, and I couldn't understand. I thought, you had all the money in the world. Haggai 2 verse 8 says, all the silver and all the gold is mine. So why can't you give me money to buy an airplane? And God said, you think it's that easy? I'm just going to give you money for anything you want. I said, well, how am I supposed to do it then? Exodus 14, verses 13, 14, and 15. Moses is standing before the Red Sea. The Egyptians are behind. And he tells Israel, do not fear. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then in verse 15, God tells Moses, stop crying unto me and tell the children of Israel to go forward. And when I read that, I knew God was speaking to me. He said, stop begging me for an airplane and go buy one. What? Go buy an airplane with no money? That's what I said. Stop begging me and crying unto me for an airplane. I've heard your cry. Now go get one. You see, God doesn't do the same thing over and over. He has a thousand ways to provide for your needs. And he will do what's best for you. And almost always what's best for you is outside of your comfort zone. Are you following my, the logic? You say, but God is asking me to do hard things. Well, try training for the Olympics and see what happens. Won't your trainer ask you to do hard things? No matter how much you run, your trainer will tell you to run more. No matter how fast you run, how high you jump, your trainer will say, that's not good enough, do more. And you say, you're just being cruel. And the trainer said, that's what they pay me for. Because I'm going to turn you into an... A, Olympic athlete. And so you go, <clears throat> and you can hate them all you want to. But their job is to train you and cut the, cut the fat out and make you lean and mean, fast and high. Correct? And God loves us too much to let us die in slothfulness. Those that he loves, he rebukes and chastens. So God says, I need to train you. It's time for the Olympics. I need, you're going to have to do some very long jumps from here. And you're going to have to hang, how many of us could hang on to a rope for a while? We're going to have to start hanging on to a rope. And so some of us better develop some arm muscles, including me. So therefore, God says, I'm going to start training you to trust a little bit. And pretty soon as you hang more and more and you see me faithful, you will be encouraged. And pretty soon you'll trust me to take you all the way through to the end. So I complained to God about this, buying an airplane without money. He said, what do you expect? I'm trying to train you. Go buy one. So I said, okay, okay, I understand. It's never easy. You're always putting me outside of my comfort zone. I went to the States. I looked for an airplane. There was an, a magazine full of thousands of airplanes. I found a really nice one. Yes, four seats, low engine time, beautiful paint job, instruments. Oh, my, the, the price. <laughs> no, I don't think 